sets your day in a, in a way that, you know, praying together, receiving strength and power and energy from the Spirit of God to, to approach your day. Amen. I see that they have the life going on. If you're watching us or you, you know, you're welcome to Word Encounter. Amen. 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 Don't forget our our our, our word encounter is our Bible study on Wednesdays and it's interactive. Amen. Amen. It means you can come with your questions on Wednesday and we you ask it and we we try to answer that. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. This is a Bible study where because we believe that throughout the week people have questions. People have people study, they have questions or they pray and they have concerns or things are going on and they have questions about it. So we we'll create this forum, this avenue through which you can ask questions and we, we, we participate in that. So we're going to take about two questions tonight. Amen? Amen. So how, how I went up before I even finished my last word. <laughs> Amen. So you're looking forward to that. Praise God. Yes. Okay. Hold on. Okay, in the Bible, you know, when Jesus was going, I can't remember where he was going, but in the Bible, I think it's in Matthew or Mark, where it talks about Jesus cursed the fig tree. Mm -hmm. My question now is, why did Jesus curse the fig tree if he knew it was out of season? Okay. I understand the fact that he was hungry okay. and in that time, because I didn't get hangry around that time. But okay. my question now is, if he already knew it was out of season, why curse the tree? So that it would never yeah. be approved. Can you read? Did you say it was out of season? Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, pass the mic for contribution. Amen. You have an answer to that. That'll be wonderful. If somebody is answering from online, let him type it. We can read it. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. I mean, I think I have an answer, but um, it's because like. The whole point of the tree is to bear fruit. And regardless of what the season is, even though it said that it was out of season, it's supposed to bear fruit. So I think Jesus probably cursed it because it wasn't doing what it was supposed to do, regardless. Like, um, it goes back to like speaking the words. So if you speak to anything and say that you will bear fruit in and out of season, regardless of what the season is, it's supposed to bear fruit. So it's cursed on based on it not doing what it's supposed to do. Okay, okay. Somebody else, somebody else. Amen. Remind your neighbor, it's Bible study. This is Bible study and it's interactive. Amen. Amen. I see somebody trying to respond this way. Okay. <laughs> somebody else. One more person. That's a common portion of scripture. Amen. You have the mind, you can respond to it. Jesus was angry. He was angry. Yeah. He was um, angry. the humanity of him. <laughs> 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 what is Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 11? Sit there. Okay. Where are you? Okay, Mark 11. Verse, verse 13. I said, and, and Jesus see the fig tree afar off, having leaves. He came, if happily he, may, he might find anything there. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. Verse 14. And Jesus answered and said unto him, No man eat fruit of thee thereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And of course, we know that, you know, the fig tree died after. So your question is, why did he curse it? Because Jesus is Lord of everything. You know, Jesus, if he demands a response, it has to be a response. Amen? I don't think there's too, you can, you can, there are too many things you can, you can make out of that. Because basically, if you want to look at it historically, people have interpreted that to mean the tree represented Israel. And Jesus came to Israel. There was no fruit to reap out of it. So there are many ways you can interpret that. But the, the simpler form is that Jesus is Lord of everything. If he demands something, he has to be there. Amen? Somebody has another question. Okay, still here. You're studying. That's a good thing. Amen. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Um, so I was 
So I've been reading Ezekiel chapters 1 through 6. And my question is, can we say that the life of Ezekiel is an almost exact resemblance to the life of Jesus? Why do you say that? Because in Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 2, God identifies him as the son of man. Okay. That was the first one. Okay. Secondly, when he spoke to the people, it reminded me that of what, he, what Jesus said to the Philistines when he gave them the word. And God said it in, I think, chapter 3 when he said, their heads are hard, but I will make your head harder. Okay. He said, uh, he said, they won't hear you. These won't be foreign people. These will be your people, but okay. they won't hear you. Something, something, something. Chapter 3, that was, that was chapter 3 mm -hmm. and 2. And then chapter 4, he gave them a charge saying, Every word that I give to you, say it to them. Because if you don't say it to them, they'll still die, but it'll be on you. Okay. But if you say it to them, then it's no longer on you, it's on them. So your question or your remark is that Ezekiel is a replica of Jesus, or his life is a symbol of Jesus? I think, that's okay. my question, is okay. it symbolic of Jesus' okay. life? Okay. One thing I want you to notice, though, with the Old Testament is that almost everything is a symbol of Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is the reason, is the message of the Bible. Yeah. That's where everything is summarized in him. You know, you know the writer of Hebrews make that real simple when he said, you know, Jesus is the express image of the Father. This is what he's saying. He said, if you're ever going to know God, there is not, there's never going to be a more perfect representation of God than Jesus. So Jesus is an expression of who God, the God that you've dreamt to know, that you've expected to see. That's him. There's no, that's the best revelation of God there's ever going to be. It's Jesus. Because God dwells in light that is unapproachable. Jesus came from the Father. Amen? He's an expression of who the Father is. So in other words, everything, the message from the very beginning, even from Adam, the, very, the goal was Jesus. So everything you interpret, and we talked about on Sunday about, you know, Isaac blessing, you know, passing on the blessing to Jacob instead of Esau. You can see that. I was just talking, talking with somebody about that. You see, you know, where Isaac was, that was a, a replica or a symbol of the throne room of God. How to approach God. And, and, and Rebecca, they, and, and most of the, the symbols that I use, they're not perfect symbols. Yeah. Because somebody's going to be used to, to, as a symbol of Jesus. That's why it's called types and shadows in theology. It's called types, and they're types and shadows of the real. Amen? So Rebecca is used there as the Holy Spirit. Because he's the one, pro, you know, propping Jacob yeah. and telling him how to approach the Father. He said, you cannot approach him but in your name. You have to clothe yourself with Esau's raiment. And Esau, who is imperfect, is representing the one who is supposed to have the blessing. You have to clothe yourself with his raiment if you're going to approach the Father. So everything in the Bible, there are little pieces scattered all over that are types and shadows of Jesus. Because he is the message of God. There's nothing else. Everything is summarized in him. Amen? That's why he said, you know, in the book of Luke 24, he said, I've come to fulfill all the law and the prophets, they all spoke of me. Ah. So every prophet, whatever, however deep their revelation was, Jesus was the ultimate goal. Amen? Amen. So everybody, if you read the Bible well, you're going to see symbols everywhere. Everywhere. Yes, Yes. Yeah, so I was just going to add to what Pastor was saying. If you read those scriptures very well, go back to your Bible. It actually identifies Jesus as the Son of Man. The Son of but Man. But Ezekiel was just called Son, son of Man. man. So that's a very big difference that's because good. that good. that definite article there, there means that Jesus is the ultimate. The ultimate. Amen. Amen. And, and there are two ways to look at Son of Man. Son of Man means natural man, means his man man. But Son of Man also means the one who is going to do the judgment. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know that? Yeah. Daniel tells us, and the Son of Man judgment was given unto him. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I kept reading the story from Sunday, and I really love your um, preaching. I just wanted to say that. Amen. But, Oh, but I was trying to understand the relation of Rachel and Leah, okay. the sisters mm -hmm. that were married to, um, to Jacob. Jacob. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to understand, okay, 
So God opened Leah's womb, mm -hmm. but he closed Rachel's. But when Rachel's womb was finally open, she died during childbirth. Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> Hallelujah. That question came, like Paul said, I was one born out of season. That question came out of season. But that's, <laughs> Hallelujah. That's a very good question. Yeah, I was really sad when she died, but then I know I kept reading. Mm -hmm. And I also saw that the son that she did for is the person that had the most blessings. The most yes. blessings. Yeah. But I was trying to understand if God opened Leah's womb because of the lack of love that Jacob had for her, then why isn't her kids also blessed like um, Rachel's son is. Mm. Okay. So someone want to say something to that, I will answer that in a prayer, in, like directly. The last sentence, don't give me, I will not direct my answer to that. Somebody want to contribute. This side needs to talk. The, th the deep thinkers are this way. <laughs> you know. They are being theological. You can see, you know what somebody's thinking. Yes, go ahead. Does it have anything to do with the promise that God gave to Jacob? Because just like in Genesis... You're asking me or you're answering me? I am, like, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> was, but it's in my mind, I think, I'm thinking along the lines of the covenant that God had made with Jacob. Okay. How he made it with Abraham and Isaac because he still had Ishmael. Okay. And even though Ishmael wasn't like completely cursed, he still wasn't a part of the blessing that okay. was for Isaac. Okay. And so Ishmael got his blessing, but it was nothing close in comparison to what Isaac had because Isaac had already had the command on him to be okay. a part of the okay. nation. So pers sorry, personally, I feel it's probably because of the promise that God had given to Jacob and Jacob's life and his lineage that it's caused... It's because of the love that he had for Rachel? I don't really because think... Because he didn't love Leah. He only loved Rachel, mm -hmm. but Rachel's womb was barren. Leah okay. was trying to impress him mm. by having as many sons as she could, and she did. That's what the Bible says. But yeah. God closed up Rachel's womb, which is the love of Jacob, and made him work 14 years in order to finally get Rachel. Mm. Yeah. And then when he finally gets her, she finally has a child, <laughs> and then she just dies. And I was just like, why did she die? <laughs> like, is she watching yeah. a movie? But <laughs> why, did, why did that actually happen? Like, that? Okay, that's good. You see, there are too many things in that story, but I'll summarize it this way. You talk about the blessing, which is really good. There is, there is God blessing you and the blessing. There is the blessing in the Old Testament. The blessing was the passing over of the promise. When God said to Abraham, the blessing shall be unto you and your descendants. Amen? That's the covenant. And the blessing, the blessing, Paul tells us clearly in the book of Galatians 3 that the seed of Abraham was not many as in seeds, but was one, which is Christ. So in other words, Paul is helping us now that the story of Abraham and God, when God said, I will bless you and your descendants, God is saying you and Christ and everybody that is going to be in Christ. Amen? Amen. So Galatians helps us. So now, look at how God blessed Jacob. Jacob is blessed, right? He has a birthright, he's blessed. Yeah. By reason of the birthright, he has access to the blessing. Amen? Amen. Now Esau comes after. He's begging to be blessed. The father loves Esau. But the father understood something. The blessing is gone. The blessing. He said, I will bless you also. But your brother Jacob has already taken so he went ahead to bless Esau, but it was a generic blessing. It's not the blessing, because the blessing is the passing over of the promise from one generation to the next. And the next generation will carry it to the next, and then Christ will finally, ultimately come from that. So God is careful the line that carries the Messianic seed from one generation to another. So Jacob was the one to carry the blessing, as you, go, you talked about all the sons were not, they were, they were all blessed. Remember when Jacob was dying, leaning on his staff in, in Egypt? Yeah. He called all of them and he blessed them. I have not read that. Oh, you're not read. Oh, oh, the movie is still going. Hey, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> so he blessed everyone before he died. Yeah. You know, and, and he went to Judah. He talked about Judah. Had, you, know, the, you know, the Messiah would come from Judah. Judah was the fourth child. Yeah. And Judah was not even of Rachel. Judah was of Leah. Yeah. But Christ came from there. So you see, so it's not about, you know, those of us were not blessed. It was about where the seed is going to come from. 
He used Joseph to preserve the whole nation, the whole, you know, the seeds of Abraham, his descendants. But the blessing did not really come from Rachel. It came from Judah, who was, who was Leah's son. You're going to find that. The movie is unfolding. Amen. So everyone was blessed, but the goal here, what to capture, is the passing over of the blessing. It's going from one generation to another. From one, one. So God is speaking who is going to carry the blessing. Because God is careful about the blessing. That's why when the Jews are going into the promised land, God warned them, do not marry these people. Because they will corrupt that blessing. Yeah. Keep it. It's going from one generation to another. Amen? Amen. We're done. Let us get into the word. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Bible is wonderful. We stay in it. Look at how she's just reading. She's talking. Her face is just smiling. It's, the word of God is wonderful. Amen? Amen? It's food that cannot be prepared by the best chef in the world. Amen. Wonderful. Nourishes you like nothing else. The mystery of fasting. Matthew chapter 4. When the season where we're seeking God, we, you know, we're pressing in. We're pressing in to reality that is available to us. We're pressing in. Amen. If, you, if, if, you're, if you're, you're fasting, you're going to take the whole 21 days without eating anything. Wonderful. If you're going to be eating in the evenings, you're going to fast from morning to six. That's wonderful. If you say you've never done that, you're still growing in that, you want to fast till three in the afternoon, that's wonderful. Amen? You want to fast till midday, that's wonderful. All I encourage you to do is to set time. Yeah. Set time to seek God and study His Word. Amen? Amen. Set, don't let things distract you too much. There's always time if you want it. There's always time. Remember the apostles said in the book of Acts, when the church started growing, you know, and life got busy. Now they had to take care of social stuff in church. The apostles remarked, the elders, because there was a temptation to be everywhere, to, to be available every time. But they said something. They said, no, you select men to do all this work. We will give ourselves to the ministry of the word and the ministry of prayer. Amen? Amen. This is a season where we give it. It's something that should be alive. But especially in this season, We've chosen to give ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayer and fasting. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. By the time we're done, after 21 days, a lot of things will fall in place for you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. You know the story. It began from chapter 3 towards the end. The Bible says, we know, Jesus came. Jesus came to be baptized. Came to the Jordan to be baptized by John. John is baptizing, his ministry is powerful, his voice is echoing through the nation. And people are coming from everywhere to be baptized by John at this time. And Jesus finally showed up. And, and then in verse 13 of, of Matthew 3, Then come a Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of you. And comest thou to me? Are you coming for me? You know, I, I, I need to be immersed into you. Because if, forget now that it's water baptism. Just look at the meaning of the word, which means immerse, immer, immersion. The word baptism means to be immersed, to be dipped into. I need to be, to be immersed into you. Jesus said, no, I need to be immersed into the purpose of God. Eh? Jesus says, suffer it not. You know, I must fulfill, we must fulfill all, we must do things the right way, we must set ourselves to accomplish God's purpose. Amen? Amen. You must set yourself, it must, be, it must be the posture of your mind. Set yourself to accomplish God's purpose. Jesus said, suffer it not. Do not hinder this. We must accomplish God's purpose. Amen? You are here up here, maybe you came for school, maybe you're working, maybe you have family. I want to tell you tonight, set yourself, set yourself, tell your neighbor, set yourself to accomplish God's purpose. Jesus said, if, suffer it not to be so. We, I must be immersed into this purpose. Because of course, that baptism represented his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's the dipping. His death is dying and resurrecting and coming out. It was symbolic of that. So he's saying, this is the mission. I must be deep into it. Amen? May your life be fully immersed into God's purpose for you. 
in the name of Jesus. And, and, and verse 16, and, and Jesus, uh, when, when he was baptized, went straight out of, out of water, and lo, the heavens opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting on him. Other versions say remaining or abiding on him, and resting, and resting on him, and resting and remaining. And, and a voice, and, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Hallelujah. Amen? The Father is identifying him, and this is this is the one. But you know, John came with a commission. John came with a commission because the purpose of the baptism was to ensure that Jesus' identity is revealed. Someone said the purpose of the baptism was to reveal Jesus' identity. That was the goal. The, the goal was to reveal Jesus who Jesus was, to, to make him known to the nation, to, to, to put him on the platform. And identify him as the Lamb of God. That was the goal. Because John told us that he that sent me said unto me, When you go baptizing, the one upon whom you are going to see the Spirit descend as a dove and remain on him. So I said, Remain. remain. All you take note of that remain on him, he is the one that has been chosen. He is the Messiah. He is the one that will sit in the office of the Christ. Amen? Amen. Because many, and we've said that here before, many mighty men have come before that God used the Spirit, came on them. For the grace came on them for a particular mission, came, rested on them at the time, and they fulfilled that mission, and the Spirit lifted. Amen? Amen. There had never been a man that the Spirit had come and abide and remained consistently. Never. It never happened in history. Jesus was the first one. And he was identified as the ideal one. The character, the one who had the character, who had been chosen by God. So by the Spirit descending and remaining, John identified him as the Christ. So the next day the Bible says Jesus is passing in the neighborhood. John pointed at him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hallelujah. Somebody say he's identified. And the Bible says the voice came from heaven. So the voice called, declared him, declared him to be the Son of God. And he was heard. He, declared, he was declared the Son of God. That was the identity. The Son of God was the identity. The Son of God was that then he was declared the son of God. And Paul picked that up in, in, in Romans chapter 1. Paul said he was declared the son of God with power. Amen? But interestingly, after he came out of what the Bible said the spirit, now we'll go to chapter 4, verse 1. Let's read from verse 1 to 10. Then what was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted? What was the purpose why he was led? He was not led to go fast. I'm trying to paint a picture here for you. There was, no, there was nothing about him going to fast in the wilderness. He was led there to be tempted. So God didn't tell him to fast. God did not ask him, say, now you need to really fast. No, the goal was to be, he was, the word that led up is the, from your version, say he was compelled. All he was constrained. It was, the spirit moved him because the spirit had a purpose for that. Amen? Because every time your identity has been, has been declared, the spirit has to make sure you defend that. As you're growing in God, you're growing in that revelation of who you are in God. You are, you're getting to know and live in that awareness that you're a child of God in reality. You're a son of God. The Spirit is leading you. Amen? Remember Abraham. I don't have time to read all those scriptures now. But remember Abraham. Abraham, God has told him a lot of things. His walk with God. He's walked with God and he had this wonderful relationship with God. But now God is ready to take Abraham to the next level. But when you walk with God, you will understand this. If God is going to move you from here to here, he has to try you. God is all about trust. He has to trust you to move you to the next level. So God said, Abraham... You finally had Isaac after all these years. After all these years, we've walked you. I've tried to build you up in faith. Finally, Isaac is here. God came to him in the night. Go kill him. (laughs) 
you'll be thinking, what is the... If, I know if you were Abraham, what you would think? The devil just came to me. <laughs> because that don't sound like God. I mean, God said, take this... God, God specified, take your son Isaac, your only son. God made sure that you don't make a mistake. I'm not talking about Ishmael. <laughs> we have to be clear here who I'm talking about. Yeah. The precious thing. The thing you're holding on to dearly. The thing you cannot let go. See, let me, let me say this. This is a spiritual order of things. If God is going to really reveal himself in trust to you, the thing that you hold dearly, he must put his finger on it. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's not a popular gospel. He must put, because see, God is not going to be in competition with nothing. <laughs> if he's going to lift your life, the thing that you hold so dearly, and not because God really wants that thing from you. God just wants you to release it from your heart. Yeah. So he can find space. God told Abraham, take him up. Abraham got up with no question. As far as we know in the Bible. If you have some kind of deep revelation, let us know. But, you know. Abraham didn't say nothing. Got up in the morning, you know, took the boy, took fire, took wood, took everything. You know, and they were going. Took two servants with them. On their way. God said, go to a mountain in Moriah. Moriah was a region of mountains. Go there, they said, I will show you. In other words, you have to stay in touch. I'm not telling you exactly where you're going. I will show you as you're going. Someone mm -hmm. said, stay in touch, stay in touch. Yeah. It's a season where we're in touch. Someone said, I'm in touch, I'm in touch. Yeah. Hallelujah. God said, I will show you specifically where you're supposed to go, where you're supposed to do this sacrifice. And when they walk on the way, they're walking, they're walking on the way. And they got to a certain, the Bible says, I'm not reading that for time's sake. They got to a certain point. Somebody say a certain point. You know, you have to preach with me or teach with me. They got to a certain point because there have to be a certain point. There, there, you know, it has to be a certain point in your walk with God. You have to be a certain place, a certain time, a certain consciousness. Abraham said, he looked at the two servants. Those were, those were men who were born in his house. So he knew they loved them. He said, but there is a step I need to take. That you cannot go with me. He said, wait here. Come on. Come on. You need to tell some, <laughs> some things. Wait yeah, here. Yeah. Or tell some things. Just, just turn around and go back. Yeah. Amen. He said, wait here. Let I and the Lord go and worship and come back to you. <laughs> Don't have time to really dissect all of that. Yeah. Let's go worship and come. So on their way, they're going. Isaac is looking. He knows. He knows the order of sacrifice. He knows. He's a child raised up in the covenant. He knows the order. He looked at the father. He said, "This is your dad." I see. I see. Because you know the Bible says Abraham gave him the wood, put it on his shoulder. He carried the wood. Someone say he carried the wood. You are talking about Jesus? Are you seeing Jesus in there? Mm -hmm. He carried the wood. Yeah. And the father had the fire and the knife. See, the father had the fire. And the knife. He's going to perform the sacrifice. But the boy turned and looked at that and said, Father, I see the wood. I see the fire. Where's the sacrifice? Listen to this. In every walk, if your walk is going, to, is going to bear fruits with God, there's a place for you to lay down. I'm not saying you are the sacrifice. Jesus has sacrificed. But it's a place for you living down here so that I can get what he has given. Amen? Amen. The father said, Abraham, in my, in, in my of the spirit, he said, he said, he said, God will provide. God will provide. But but listen to this. God is trying Abraham because he wants to lift him up. Someone say lift him up. So Abraham is going to enter a realm that he had never experienced by now, before now. Because he has he at this time he's experienced the, the miracle, the miracle of a, a child being born in an unusual way. Isaac is born, he's experienced birth. A miraculous birth of a man of 100 years old and a woman of 90 years old. He's experienced that. But what he has never experienced, what God's going to show him. He got up the mountain, tied the boy, 
and took the knife out to slay the boy. And he heard a voice from heaven say, Abraham, touch not that boy. Look in front of you, there's a lamb, there's a ram that is cut. So God provided the sacrifice. Amen? Amen. And the ram was cut in the bush. But now, listen to this. Listen. Hebrews tells us, say, Abraham had convinced himself that even if I kill this boy, God was able to raise him up. So he was persuaded about God's faithfulness. But what God took him into was the realm of resurrection. So God has lifted Abraham's experience from just knowing a miraculous birth to the realm of resurrection. Because God said, the Bible said, God looked at him, God said, the boy might as well have died because he killed the boy in his heart. Because he was already going to kill the boy. It was God who stopped him. He was not playing. He was not trying to see if God's going to stop him. He was going to kill the boy. So in his heart, he had let go. And God lifted him into the realm of resurrection. Amen? Amen? God tried him and he proved himself faithful. And God said, next step. Hallelujah. Tell you, you're going to the next step. So you're going to the next step. After this fast, you are entering the next step. In the name of Jesus. Jesus is about to fulfill the mission of a lifetime. And the spirit, see, it was not the devil that took him to the wilderness. It was, that was the spirit of God led him to be tempted. Compelled him, moved him, drove him to the wilderness. Amen? Amen. If you've never felt that drive before, it's coming. <laughs> the spirit drove him. <laughs> I say it's coming, whether you like it or not. If you're going to make progress with God, the drive will come. If he doesn't, if, if he tries, it doesn't come in the way you, you understand. It will come by persecution. Mm. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, he went to the wilderness. Again, I said, Jesus was not going there to fast. The instruction was not to go fast. The Spirit led him to be tempted. The Bible is clear about that. But the man went in and saw the weight of the assignment. And saw how heavy the assignment was that was before him. He decided that I'm going to fast. Because this assignment must be accomplished. Why we are fasting right now? Because we have seen the assignment. We know, we know what is ahead of us. So we are preparing ourselves by fasting. God did not ask him to do it. But he saw the assignment. And he said, I'm going to enter into a time of fasting. Are you entering a time of fasting? Yes. Are you in a time of fasting? Yes. Because Jesus arrived there before the temptation. There was no temptation when he arrived. Ah, uh, let's read it. Let's read it. <laughs> Verse 1, chapter 4. Then Jesus led up of the spring to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungry. See, after he fasted, then the temptation came. It's not like he went there and they started tempting him. No, it's after he's done fasting. The Bible says, and the tempter came to him and said, If thou be the Son of God, command the stones to be made bread. Verse 4. But he said unto him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taken him up into a holy city and set him up on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, I want you to notice all the you know, you know what predicated that the premise of the temptation is, is the identity. If you are the son of God, that was that was the subject of the temptations. Because again, there had been a pronouncement from heaven that thou my beloved son. So the enemy came for that. 
So there's a word of prophecy released against you. See, that's why you saw when you receive, you receive all the prophecy, you fold your arm, wait for it to happen. Now, once the prophecy is, re- is released, then it comes for it. Yeah. It was spoken from heaven. Mm-hmm. The devil said, Oh, you are the son of God. You're going to prove it. Mm-hmm. Amen? Mm-hmm. He said to him, If thou be the son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time thou dash your foot against a stone. He's quoting Psalm 91 in a funny, interesting way. <laughs> That's the devil now. Verse 7 Jesus said unto him, If it is written, Thou shalt not tell the Lord thy God. Verse 8, again the devil taken him up in an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto him, as all these things I will give you if thou will fall down and worship me. You see the audacity? That Jesus will worship him. Then said Jesus unto him, get thee hand, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only. Shall thou serve? I want you, if you notice those temptations, they, they fall in three categories. The first thing is that you're going to eat. Amen? <laughs> uh, because, look, see, the enemy has, he has, he has, he has um, uh, ancient wisdom to his resume. He's lived for thousands of years. I tell you, all those people who are burning devils in bread, they don't burn. Devils are spirits that live. The same devils that were in the Bible, they are still here. Ancient spirits. So they don't have wisdom like that, but they have longevity. And by experience, I've seen a few things happen over and over. They know when you're going to make shit break, because they've seen it before. They know when you've left an open door in your life, because they've seen it before. They have experience. By reason of age. <laughs> Notice the first thing is a temptation to eat. Because he, the man said he realized that the weak, the only weakness that Jesus had is hunger. And he's gonna press in the area of weakness. We all know it here. The area of temptation that is strongest is the area where you keep stumbling. The area of weakness. He knows it because he said it over and over. Not because he's smart. I was telling somebody I said, I said, I said, I said, I said the enemy is not wise like that. He uses you know, crooked wisdom. Because it, 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 he doesn't know everything. Hope you know that. Okay, I'll prove it to you. I told somebody, I don't know what I was talking about yesterday. Somebody. You know, if the enemy knew everything. When Jesus was born, and God came and gave Joseph a dream and said, Take the boy to Egypt until Herod died. <laughs> Joseph took the boy and went to Egypt. The devil came to Herod and said, Kill all the two year old. <laughs> In killing that, you will kill the boy. Are you seeing that? <laughs> He's dumb like that. The boy is in Egypt. He's killing people in Israel, hoping to get the boy. <laughs> it's not that small. I'm telling you, I'm telling you the truth. Okay, now, I, they, go on going to Egypt, they did not take a plane. They walked on the, maybe a camel, or so they could be seen. Which also tells you the devil is not everywhere. He could have seen them going to Egypt. And that will break some unnecessary stuff. But the truth is that he has a network of demons that are everywhere. But they don't know everything like that. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> the first temptation, hunger. Because there are three temptations that if we're going to fulfill purpose, we're going to have to overcome. The first thing, the lust of the flesh. Whatever our bodies want us to do, whatever, you know, the militation of our soul, of our flesh, you know, that strong desire, it can hinder us. 
The second thing is the loss of the eyes. The Bible said he took him, he took him and showed him the kingdoms. Say, look at that. Look at how glorious they are. He showed it to him and their glory. And then the third thing is the pride of life. It's I'll make you king. But look at this. It's the same temptation that he did to Adam in the garden. Came to Eve and said, Eat this fruit. The Bible said Eve looked at it and he desired it for food. It was still food. The second thing is that Eve looked at it. He said he was, he was, he, he, she desired it was good to the eye or pleasant to the eyes. Second thing, lust of the eyes. And then the third thing, the Bible said it was food to make one wise. Pride of life. Same thing. Amen? Amen. Um, the, the Bible said, John said the same thing. <laughs> John said the same thing. He said the same thing. He said in the first John, you know, chapter 2, verse 16. He said, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father. He said, you have to overcome those things. So Jesus knew that the enemy is going to compress. And he said, I'm going to enter into fasting. And so do the flesh so that I can rise up with power and fulfill purpose. Amen? Amen. This is a time of subduing, subduing, tell somebody subduing, subduing. <laughs> Jesus employed a mechanism that Adam did not. That's why Adam fell. Adam didn't even know what fasting was. God had given him all the food in the guy, he kept eating. He kept eating. He thought he was just eating and having fun. Until the enemy showed up. Don't, he didn't prepare for it. Jesus looked at the, the work of the assignment. He said, 40 days. <laughs> I love that. Ah, it is an area in you that's troubling you. Your flesh is too active. So I'll give you seven days. I tell them I'm, I'm being merciful. I'm not saying, you know, we, we do things by performance. But you want to subdue flesh. Amen? Amen? You want to put things under. So the spirit can rise with power. Because Jesus knew that if I'm going to accomplish this. See, there's been a declaration that I'm the son of God. And there's an assignment attached to it. If I'm going to accomplish that. The spirit needs to rise up with power. Yeah. I will declare this year to be the year of building. If you're going to build by the spirit, the spirit needs to rise up with power. Somebody said with power. Yeah. So he employed the mechanism of fasting in view of the temptation that was going to happen. Because the levels of the spirit that you will not go, you will not go beyond. Until you break through that barrier. Amen. Ecclesiastes, the wise spirit, the wise preacher said, he said, you know, they, they, they look at the winds, they look at the winds, and they look at the clouds when they want to do something. They look for physical signs. He said, Why? Because they know not the way of the spirit. So all the judgments, Ecclesiastes 11 verse 5, that's the scripture. All the judgments are made based on physical signs. Because they know not the way of the Spirit. The Spirit will trace away a pathway that nothing else can follow except it be in the Spirit. No wonder Moses said, Lord, show me your way that I may know you. There's a way of the Spirit. If your life is according to that way, which will have been brought into, been brought into that way, if we just live accordingly, there's an amazing, an amazing reality that will happen with us. So, what is fasting? First thing, fasting is the fasting is the is the subduing of the flesh in order to increase the weight of your spirit. The subduing of the flesh in order to increase the weight and capacity of your spirit. In other words, it is the strengthening. Because it's fasting and prayer. 
It is the strengthening of your spirit. Because there are things that only your spirit can do. There are things only your spirit can accomplish. There are things only your spirit can accomplish. The assignment that God has over your life, only your spirit can accomplish it. But the beautiful thing is that in your spirit, God has given you all the capacity to accomplish it. All you need to do is strengthen it. Amen? Strengthen it and receive inspiration into your spirit. Second, second, second meaning of fast. What is fast? The second point. It's to make it intentionally impossible. Listen to this. Make it intentionally impossible for your flesh to be what will respond when you're under pressure. To make it, in, I mean, you're intentional about it. Make it impossible that your flesh will be the one to respond when you're under pressure. You know you're under pressure, you know you want to respond. You have to, pressure comes, you want to respond. And your flesh is the first thing to respond. What fasting does is that it, it hinders the flesh from responding. It weakens the ability of the flesh to respond all the time. And in a sense, it's passing a message to your flesh that we are not just flesh in this household. And you're not the leader. <laughs> tell, tell yourself, my flesh is not the leader. <laughs> Say, my spirit is the leader in this, in this household. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You'll be doing yourself well if you just understand that. The spirit is the first thing. Amen? You'll be amazed at the power and the wisdom you rise up with. The wisdom of God is in your spirit. You are amazed at how you rise up with no wisdom that you never knew was there. And this is what this fasting, you, that's one of the things you will accomplish. You rise up and you realize that the wisdom of God is working in you more than it's ever been. Amen? Because you, you're pressing in, you're tapping, you're tapping into a reservoir of wisdom that is embedded in you. We said in 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 1 verse 30, it said Christ has been made unto us wisdom. He's in there. Wisdom is in your spirit. Fasting will press in and tap into that reservoir. That's right. Amen. 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 You don't lack wisdom. I know James said any man lacking wisdom. Wisdom is in you. He's in you. You're pressing. The third point why we fast. What is fasting? It's a mechanism by which <laughs> you are shielded and insulated. <laughs> Let me just explain that before I give that, you know, I, I define it. You know, people who, who walk by the flesh is a way, there's a way to respond to, to things. Hmm? The way to respond to arguments and the, the way to make judgments, you know. But when you fast, you are, you, are, you are shielded from that kind of response. You are insulated from the responses of the kind of people. You, are, you, you take a different path, the way of the Spirit. Amen? Because fasting will shut that, it will shut that activity, it will shut it down. It said, this is not the route. It will shut that route down and show you another way. As you pray and fast, this is the way walking it. In other words, like we said on Sunday, you will not be a man of the outdoors. You will be a man of the tent. So I'm a man of the tent. I dwell on the inside. My life is from the inside. Like I told you, everything. See, this is this is this is the this is the you know you know the, the, the dilemma because everything we need to succeed in this life, God has given us in our spirit. The unfortunate thing is that most people will live their lives and never have make make access or inroad into that reservoir, into that reserve. First thing is like you know that you're putting pressure. You're adding pressure. You're praying and adding fasting to it. You're, you're putting pressure and going deeper, digging into the wealth that is already yeah. in you. It's like, it's like somebody who discovers that, you know, you know, if you live in Texas or Oklahoma, you understand that people have private wells where, you know, have you seen that before? And if, if, not seen, if you've not seen a, a full-blown re refinery, but you, at least you've seen the wells that, you know, tap oil, because somebody discovered this all, you know, they did their survey, the feasibility studies, they discovered this all underneath the surface. We're going to put pressure 
so the oil can come out. The oil of God is in you. You see, the depth of reservoir in you is deeper than any refinery. Put pressure on it. Put pressure on it. Everything you're looking for is in that reservoir. Fasting will dig deep. Prayer goes in, but fasting added to it will go even deeper. Amen? Amen? Another point. Can I finish three? It's the mechanism by which you are insulated or shielded from the things that generate responses from common people. You are shielded from it. Amen. So your path is different. Amen? Amen. You are beco you're, you're becoming a, an expression of all the good things that are in you. Hallelujah. Amen. I see you're becoming an expression of all the good things that are in you. Amen. Because there's too much good on the inside of you. you there's too much good. I said on Sunday, like, you know, Paul wonderfully said in, you know, in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7, we have in this treasure in earthen vessels. He says you are, you are a vessel of earth, but you have super human treasure on the inside of you. In other words, listen to this. You are a vessel of humanity, energized and operated by the divine. <laughs> You are a vessel, a fleshly vessel. But the power within you is divinity. But until you tap into it, you will not know that by experience. All of us in that journey, we're pressing in. This, we're pressing in in this fact. We're pushing in. We're getting at 530. We're pressing in. Amen? We're putting pressure so the oil can flow and affect every area of our lives. Because it's in there. It's in there. It's not somewhere. It's not somewhere where you go get it. It's on the inside of you. Amen? Amen. It's a serious time. Where we were. Because, because Jesus looked at He looked at He saw the seriousness. You see, you know, the, the unfortunate thing is that most people haven't seen the seriousness of the assignment before. Them. That's the unfortunate thing. Because if you discover, if you realize, you know, you know the, 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 the gravity of what is ahead of you, the calling upon your life, the goodness of God that he wants to manifest with you, if you understand it, like Jesus looked at it, he said, I'm the son of God. I'm the son of God. There's been a pronouncement. There's been a declaration. I'm the son of God. It means there's a manifestation that must happen with my life. And he knows that because the spirit had witnessed him that he's going to be tempted. The Bible clearly says, led to be tempted by the day. He knew that the devil is coming. He's going to try to derail me from the program. He said, I'm going to enter into fasting to shut that door down and rise up with power. Amen? Amen. So I'm rising up. I'm rising up, I'm rising up I'm rising with up. the power of the spirit. I'm rising up. I'm, rising up. I'm soaring. With the wings of an eagle. You see, the strength of that wing will come from this fasting. Your wings will be strengthened. It will be strengthened. Because the eagle goes up, way up, and flies against the wind. So the wings need to be strengthened to be on the opposite side of challenges. Fasting will strengthen those wings. Amen? Amen? I feel strength rise. I mean, from the first day, if I just felt strength rise, I said, this is a different kind of strength. <laughs> Hallelujah. No wonder Jesus said, this can only come by prayer and fasting. Fasting added to prayer, it does something different. Yeah. There is no man, no woman, look at it in the Bible, who fulfilled that kind of calling, who didn't engage in the mechanism of fasting. Look at Moses. God did not ask him to fast. God said, come up the mountain. But he went up the first time. He, he went up, he saw the kind of glory that was on the mountain. He said, no, no, no. Flesh cannot be a part of this. Mm, come on. Come on. Mm, mm. You know, the Bible says God called them up. They went up with the elders. They sat. The Bible says, that's Exodus 24. They, they went up, they sat down. They saw God. Your Bible says that. And they ate and they drank. They have communion of the divine. 
Men like you sat down with God and had a drink. Someone said they had a drink. They had a drink. <laughs> so God can commune like that. You see, don't see God as some kind of a strange creature. No, they sat and had a drink with God. <laughs> Listen. When the devil asked Jesus to stone stones to break, Jesus went. I know you think he just went. Jesus went into the archives and said, "Okay, before we made man, there was something that was said about the constitution of this being, how he is going to function." And Jesus is the perfect man. He's God's idea of who a man should be. I hope you know that. So he went into the archives. He looked at it. Man shall not live by bread alone. It is written against his name that he's not supposed to live like that. So there's a way that God has defined for man to live. Jesus said, that's the way I'm going to live. Because the challenge was, because you see, see, looking at it from the flesh, you think, ah, oh, Jesus failed. He didn't have power to turn the stones. Hmm? But he didn't have anything to prove. Because he looked into the archive against man. Man shall not live by bread alone. You know, at my home, at times my mom is there. <laughs> I'll go all day, I don't eat. She's watching me. <laughs> she'll say, she'll say, you know, I want to go out, I'll take strawberry and eat and drink water. She was saying, see, you have eaten. <laughs> <laughs> you have eaten all day. Are you watching me? <laughs> I miss you eat anything. <laughs> My existence is energized differently. I know me. There are things that will never catch me anymore. Because I know I've looked at the Constitution. Man shall not live. My brother. My brother. <laughs> there is a way, there is a kind of energy that comes from divine nutrition that you can't get any other way. <laughs> God, see, I was looking forward to this fast. I'm telling you the truth because I know I fast by myself. I'm just looking for something else to add it. Because I found out that in our, in our makeup, there's another way we should live. By every word. How do you think Jesus stayed the word of word? The word that comes from God's mouth sustains you in ways that physical food cannot. The enemy thought he was weak because he was hungry in the flesh. But the enemy found out that what that hunger did instead made way for the spirit. And the man got even stronger mm -hmm. when he faced him. I see you're getting stronger. As we're fasting, you're getting stronger. You're getting more robust in the spirit. Energy, divine strength is entering your bones in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Man shall not live by bread alone. For every word. Not written word now. Not, not just... Don't have time to tell you about, about, about that, but you know, every word that proceeds, that comes, that God keeps on talking. As God talks, your spirit is eating. God talks, your spirit is being nourished. Amen? Amen. You, it's clarity. The flesh is not in the way. Because fasting has broken the mechanism of the, of the flesh. And your spirit is waking up into another reality. You will not be the same after we're done. You will not be the same. You know Daniel and the friends, you know what they did after the fasting. Daniel fasted. And he cleared. See, why he was fasting? Because see, when you're fasting, another thing that fasting does is that, at that another point, you know, I know I said a lot of things before this point. It's another point. What fasting does is that it 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 activates angelic assistance. The Bible says with Jesus, after angels came and ministered to him. Angels came and ministered to him. So the man was in the wilderness. 
Where there are wild beasts all over the place. But angels were there. Meeting his needs. They came and ministered. I know the Bible didn't give us details of what really happened. But you can tell from a little bit from Elijah's life. How the angel came and cooked him breakfast. <laughs> what we do at 5 10 is that we eat breakfast from the hands of angels. Cooked from the quarters of heaven. The Bible says, if the angel fed him, the, it was so heavy, the food was so heavy, if he fell asleep again, he went back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and the angel came walking out and said, Eat some more. <laughs> I said to him, The journey, I want to show you the same picture. The journey is long. The assignment is big. What you have before you is heavy. Take time to eat spiritual food. Amen? Amen. What we do in this fast, we're taking time. We've seen the journey. You've seen the journey of your life. You know, you may not see in pictures. You know in your heart the depth of your call. You know, see that highest dream that you've dreamt about your calling. How if, it's, if it works perfectly the way it should be, it's in your heart. You've seen it like that. All we're doing like this is to nourish up for that. Fasting. Activate angelic support. Angelic assistance. They come to our aid and say they have given up everything. We are there to support with spiritual nourishment. Hallelujah. They will <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Amen. So in preparing for temptation, Jesus shut down the operations of the flesh. He shut down that powerhouse. And the only avenue for feeding was the avenue of the spirit. The only avenue. Tell them for me, do not invest in the wrong things. Say that's high investment. Fasting and prayer is high investment for a high turnover, a high outcome, a high outcome, a high outcome, a robust outcome. Amen? Amen. It's a high investment. We're not wasting time. We're not. I'm telling you. We're not wasting time. We're investing. We're investing. And the outcome will not, will not mistake it. Amen? I said we'll not mistake it. Amen. We'll not mistake it. Hallelujah. So the reason for the temptation was to distort, to attack that identity. Again, we know who we are. We emphasize that in this house, we know who we are. And especially this year, we know what we're called to do. And there's resistance to it. Oh, how Adam missed out on that. And Adam, if he knew, if he knew, if he knew. The enemy doesn't do new, new temptations. He just recycles the same ones with different packaging. Same thing he did in the garden. The same thing he did with Jesus. The same thing he does with us. Just different packaging. If you master him by the word, you've mastered him. Amen? Amen. No wonder the Bible says in the book of James, submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee. Someone say he will flee. <laughs> So this is the time now as you so we're submitting to God. We're submitting. We're submitting. By the Spirit, we're submitting in fasting. Mm. And it gives us strength to resist the enemy in every way. And the outcome is known. He will flee from you. Amen? Amen. 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 I'm not ready to really get into this fast. Yes. I want to see more people in that morning call. Amen, amen. We got somebody just enrolled. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you on the on the, on the on the WhatsApp group? No, I'm in the foundation for that. You don't you, you don't mind being included in the WhatsApp group? No, I don't mind. Somebody include her, so because the information is posted there. Okay. You know, the, the Zoom call and then the code to get in. Amen. Thirty minutes only in the morning, five thirty to six. Hallelujah. Some of you 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 will make you go to bed early. Somewhere you used to stay up all night, you go to bed early. You can get up at 5.30. Amen. Pray for 30 minutes. Hallelujah. Stand on your feet tonight.
You have seen the assignment. You have seen the assignment. You have seen the assignment. I told myself, I said, hey, you know, it's impossible to accomplish the mission of God in your life on earth until that power on the inside breaks loose. If you are not tapped into, you don't tap into that power that's in you. If you don't tap into that reservoir, that investment in you, you will never accomplish God's purpose the way you should. So the goal is to tap into that. And I want you to cry to God to, tonight and say, Lord, I don't want to live my life and go through this earth and not fulfill your mission. I don't want to live through this earth and just live and accomplish things that are not in God's agenda. But in order for me to fulfill God's agenda, the power has been given to you to do that. All you need to do is press into it. Is press into it. Is press into it. Is to press into it. Is to press into it. Fasting removes distractions so we can press into it and lay our hands on that reservoir of God's grace and power and enablement and energy and activate the angelic and stir up the supernatural realm to walk on our behalf, to work to our favor. So that whatever it is, be the, the loss of the eyes, the loss of the pride of life, nothing will have anything to overcome us. Nothing will be able because we have positioned ourselves, aligned ourselves to function by that investment. Come open your voice and pray tonight. Say, Father, I don't want to go through this life and don't accomplish purpose. Come on, pray, 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 pray tonight, pray tonight. I don't want to go through this life without accomplishing that mission. Jesus knew that the mission was heavy. He knew, he knew all the people that are going to depend on him. But ultimately, he knew that the cross was coming. There's no way I can overcome the obstacle. There's no way I can fulfill this call. The call is heavy. The call is heavy. There's no way I can fulfill it until until the me of me is subdued. Until the me of me is subdued. Because you are made to function not by your own power. You are made to function by divine strength. Your life is built in such a way that the strength by which you operate is not of human origin. But for us to press into that, first thing we'll enhance it, we'll enhance it, we'll enhance it, we'll enhance it. Hallelujah, Father, thank you tonight. Oh, Lord, we refuse. We refuse to live through this life and just spin the wheels. Lord, we don't want to accomplish things without accomplishing divine purpose. The reason why we're here, the reason why we're here, Lord, the assignment before us. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Fasting will even bring more clarity to that assignment. It will bring more clarity, more clarity. Because the flesh, the things, the activities, the activeness of the flesh will be taken out of the way. And your life will begin to be motivated by spirit to spiritual life. Oh, precious Lord, precious Lord, come on, talk to God. I refuse, I refuse, I refuse to live my life without accomplishing your purpose. I refuse to live my life without accomplishing your purpose. I refuse to live my life without accomplishing your purpose. If I've been called a son of God, there is a purpose attached to it. There is a function of my life attached to my identity. I must accomplish it. I must accomplish it. I must accomplish it. Fasting is one of the factors. Not because we're trying to make God do things by fasting. No! It's helping us step into what God has already done. What He has already done. He has given us more than enough. All things that pertain unto life and godliness. He has given us all things. But how do we make access, have access to it? We press in by prayer. And we add fasting. That makes it more sharp. It makes our access even sharper. Into all the goodness of God. 
Oh, come on, pray, pray, pray. Hallelujah. Say there's a reality that must that must be made manifest through my life. There's a reality about me that must be made manifest. There is a reality about my life. There is a reality about me that must come to pass. It's in the spirit. It's embedded within me. I'm digging into it. I'm tapping into it. I'm tapping into There's a reality about my life that must come to pass. 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 Hallelujah. That must come to pass. That must come to pass. Jesus made sure there was no area of weakness. He shut it down. He shut it down. He shut it down. He shut it down. I declare upon you tonight in the name of Jesus whatever avenue through which the enemy comes and every time you stumble let that door be shut as we fast let that door be shut in the name of Jesus thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord we are ready to go for go higher we are ready to move forward we are ready to make progress. We are going higher and higher. We are passing every test. We are passing every trial. Our lives are moved, are being moved to the level of one level of glory to another. Our lives are moved from one level of glory to another. Our lives are moved from one depth in God to another. We give you praise. 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 In the name of Jesus. Listen to this. Listen, listen, listen. Jesus, Jesus. I tried to look at how Jesus lived. And I found out something. Jesus, all he did was present an earthly body to the Father. So the Father's will could be done. That's why he said, I do nothing on my own.